Keeping people alive is important, but creating an environment in which they can recover, uh, a new generation can learn and be prepared for a post-war situation is also important. We have to prepare for the future as well as keeping people alive today. Hello and welcome to G-Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer. And today, as Afghanistan's implosion was making international headlines, another desperate conflict raged on in the background. Seven years of continuous war, and today Yemen is called the world's worst humanitarian crisis. 80% of the population needs aid to survive. Two-thirds of all Yemenis are hungry. Nearly half don't know when they will eat their next meal. More than 10,000 children have been killed or maimed by fighting, and there's no end in sight. I speak to David Gressley. He's the UN's resident coordinator in Yemen about whether the world can put an end to this intractable conflict. And then your Cafe Mocha was named after Yemen's Port of Mocha. It's a coffee hub dating back to the 1300s. We talked to some entrepreneurs in Brooklyn who are bringing coffee back to its Arabian roots. But first, and what's the problem with his hands? What happened? Oh my gosh, it's red raw. Why? Why is he eating his fingers? Yemen, according to UNICEF, is the most difficult place in the world to be a child. Crumbling infrastructure from regular airstrikes, leading to poor sanitation, outbreaks of infectious disease, cholera, diphtheria. COVID has hit the country hard, and inflation is so bad that even those with money struggle to afford food. And those are the issues that Yemenis face if they're lucky enough to make it through the day. The United Nations estimates the total death toll so far will hit 377,000 by the end of the year. How did things get this bad? And how did Yemen, which is a beautiful country on the Red Sea, known for its coffee, its honey, become a proxy war for regional powers and international actors. It's complicated, and there are a lot of parties involved. The conflict in Yemen's roots can be traced back to the Arab Spring in 2011, when Yemenis protested against their longtime leader, Ali Abdullah Saleh. Demonstrations were mostly peaceful, but 50 people were killed. Saleh himself, survived an assassination attempt. Then in comes the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC. That's kind of the regional organization that matters. A handful of Sunni majority monarchies with the bloc's most powerful player, Saudi Arabia, usually taking the lead on regional geopolitical issues. The GCC struck a deal with Yemen's embattled leader to hand over the country to his vice president, Abrabu Mansour Hadi, in exchange for immunity. Groups like the Houthis, a Shia Muslim movement in the north of Yemen, saw this as a move to reinstall the same political elites in power, and they came out strongly against Hadi. And in a Game of Thrones-style twist, the Houthis joined forces with their former rival, the deposed president, Saleh, in hopes that their alliance would topple the new Saudi-backed government. Bye -bye. The Houthis, with the help of Saleh loyalists, took the capital, Sana'a, President Hadi was forced to flee to Saudi Arabia, who had been supporting him. In response, the Saudis formed a coalition that initially included the UAE, Egypt, Qatar, and Jordan, with support from the United States, the UK, and France in the form of logistics, intelligence, training, and weapons. Seeing the odds stack quickly against the Houthis, Saleh eventually disavowed the group in favor of negotiations back with the Saudis. Two days later, he was killed. Saudi Arabia says that its primary objective in Yemen is to contain Iran's influence in the region. And they say Iran openly supports the Houthis, though the Iranians implausibly deny giving the group any military support. One incident back in 2019 brings the Iranian claim into serious doubt. A twin attack at night with drones on two major Saudi oil facilities, one of them the largest in the world. The Houthis took responsibility for the attack, but investigations by the United Nations, by the U.S., and by the Saudis all concluded Iran was to blame. 
After seven years of fighting, Saudi Arabia and Iran continue to use Yemen as a theater of war, and civilians are caught in the crossfire. Since the war began, more than 24,000 Saudi-led coalition airstrikes have hit Yemen. One in 2018 hit a school bus and killed 26 young children, injured 19 more in a busy market. In response, aid groups have repeatedly called on the international community to ban weapons sales to Saudi Arabia. And they're saying that the United States, the United Kingdom and France are at least partly to blame for the scale of human suffering that we are seeing today. David Gressley is the United Nations resident coordinator in Yemen, and he has seen what life is like on the ground and the consequences of this endless battle. Here's our conversation. David Gressley, thanks so much for joining us on G Zero World. It's a great pleasure, thank you very much. Tell us a little bit what life is just like day to day in Yemen right now. It's really hard, frankly. Uh, I've had the, the privilege actually of traveling extensively inside Yemen and I see uh, every day the impact the war has had on people. Um, I, I see it in the schools that have been destroyed. I see it in the infrastructure, roads and bridges uh, that are not functional. Uh, but more important, I see the people. I, I remember one trip up towards Hudaydah on the Red Sea coast and I was traveling in an area that very few people had been able to get into, and that was the whole purpose was to get there. And just traveling and, and talking to people, they're worried about landmines in their fields, their landmines in the schools, the uh, unexploded ordnance uh, that kills and maims people nearly every day. Uh, they, they don't have access to water because of uh, the front lines. They can't cross over to where their fields are or where their schools are, or where their health clinics are. It's, it's sad because as I travel around, many people, particularly mothers, grab my arm physically and, and just say, I, I, basically they have a story they want to tell about what they're facing trying to, to keep their children alive, to get their children an education, uh, to get the medical attention that they need. It's just devastating and it's just every year the war goes on, it gets worse for, for all of these uh, Yemeni people. And I mean, what does government feel like for the average citizen on the ground? Who, who are they looking to for any relief at this point? Outside of the international assistance that's coming in, which is considerable, over $2 billion of assistance a year, uh, it's important to keep in mind that it's a civil war. So there's two governments. There's the recognized government headquartered in Aden right now, and then the uh, controlling authority in the north, uh, based in, in Sana, and, and both are quite challenged, frankly, to provide basic services. Uh, we do a lot of that. We provide the fuel, we provide for, for hospitals, for water systems. It's very hard to find the funding to keep the, these operations going. Those governments don't have the resources. In the southern part of the country, you have um, a currency that continues to decline, the real has hit lows as, as much as 1700 to the dollar, and it was not so many years ago, about 250. Purchasing power has considerably declined. So the cost of food has gone up for, for everyone. The cost of transportation, distribution has all been complicated by the conflict, so it's very expensive to buy food. Um, so these impediments, uh, combined with the loss of income for, for people means that the, their incomes have gone down, prices have come, have come up, and it's basically what's creating the food insecurity that we see throughout the country affecting 20 million people. So it's really hard to see how these two different governments that are currently fighting each other can significantly contribute to the social welfare of the people uh, on either side of the front lines. You've said that the UN is providing about $2 billion a year. How much can you not do? What is the most urgent that just can't, be, can't in any way be provided given the resources you presently have? Well, we're looking actually this year for $3.6 billion just for Yemen alone, of which we've got about $2.1 billion. So there is that gap of $1.5 billion. That means people do not get a full ration of food. Uh, we're having to do half or three quarter rations, so that's uh, a, a major problem. But the bigger problem really is on the healthcare side. There isn't sufficient money for keeping uh, hospitals operating or clinics in rural areas operating. Uh, the hospitals are overrun now because of most of the clinics are closed. We're only getting about 20% of the money that, that we are asking for for health. 
The same is true in, in, for water uh, supplies, clean water. Between health and clean water, if you don't have adequate resources, and we don't, only about 20%, uh, that contributes as much to, to uh, mortality as, as lack of food. Then support for the internally displaced, 4 million people. We can't support 4 million people at this point in time with the resources that we have. We do as much as we can, but the shelter that they require, we don't have funding really for that. So simple things like the dignity that people have from a, a basic shelter or privacy for women is missing. Education for the displaced, missing. Livelihoods for the displaced, missing. So there are big pieces that are missing. Keeping people alive is important, but creating an environment in which they can recover, uh, a new generation can, can, can learn and be prepared for a post-war situation is also important. We have to prepare for the future as well as keeping people alive today. All of that is missing right now. Now, one of the stats I saw that quite surprised me was some 1.2 million civil servants in Yemen they're not being paid, but they go to work every day. Now, I mean, you're obviously working with a lot of these people. Um, what's keeping them going? Many things keep them going, actually. One is just a sense of responsibility. They know that they're the ones that are keeping people alive. If they're working in a hospital or they're teachers, uh, educating a new generation. Uh, so they continue to, to try to do what they can. But there are limits to that, and, and bit by bit, they, people do stop uh, coming to work. If we lose them, then, then our ability to support the population also collapses. So for multiple reasons, we need to work, and we're looking to work with both the governments, but also with international partners on how we can overcome that particular problem. I see it as one of the more serious problems that the country faces today. If we were able to bring this war to an end, I mean, does the Yemeni economy have honest, sustainable prospects going forward? I think so. There are very talented people uh, throughout Yemen. I've been struck by that. Uh, so the human capital part, I think, is, is actually there. Um, the problem is the war itself in, in many ways. Um, so I, I don't think it would be that difficult to, to, uh, to uh, regenerate an economy if there's a real peace. Yemen may not be agriculturally self-sufficient, but it can generate enough uh, income uh, to pay for imports. And, uh, and I think that a lot of uh, success can be had. And there are certain industries like the fisheries industries. I mean, we, there's the Red Sea coast and the Arabian coast that provide uh, ample fishing opportunities that used to be the third largest uh, export earner, in fact, for Yemen. Uh, was the fisheries uh, sector. And that should be fairly straightforward also to resurrect in, in the context of peace. So I, I'm not at all pessimistic about, uh, about Yemen. It has oil, it has untapped oil reserves and gas reserves, as well as what it's currently exporting. Uh, so the potential I think is quite, quite good. Is there hope, I mean, beyond the challenges of getting the two sides together inside Yemen, is there hope that we could see a real fundamental breakthrough between the Emiratis and the Saudis on the one side, Iran on the other, and that just changes the ball game? Well, I think if that were to happen, it certainly would, would change things um, on the ground. Um, I, I do have to say, uh, as a, a bit of a caveat, only a partial one, that the, author the controlling authorities in, in Sana'a um, uh, do try to demonstrate a degree of independence uh, from Iran um, uh, and, and do resist uh, some, uh, some of that, that pressure that I think you're implying. And, and I do think it's a way forward, uh, to find a way forward, would be uh, at least in part through the regional countries involved. But it also requires work internally if we're going to really see it uh, to be successful in the, in the long term. Well, 20 million Yemenis, uh, certainly thankful uh, that you're there and doing the good work that you are. I hope you get a little, a little bit of downtime over the holidays as you go back uh, in very short order. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great talking to you. Thank you very much. Yemeni coffee is said to be among the best in the world. Yemenis say that. That's right, they do. Bags of it can fetch upwards of $200 a pound. 
Oh my God. And some Yemeni Americans in Brooklyn, New York, have traded selling cups of standard bodega brew for high-end beans from their native country. Welcome to the Diwan Cafe. I'm Jabbar Zanta. I'm one of the founders of this business. My name is Usam Hatem and my partner slash cousin Jabbar Zanta. We are the owners of Diwan Cafe, which is located in downtown Brooklyn. And we make every cup from scratch, so it's not like the, the typical coffee pour over. Um, every cup is made on the spot to give you the fresh experience of Yemeni coffee. We import our coffee beans from Yemen, from Hadaz. And it's, it's considered one of the top quality coffee beans in the world. What's interesting about the Yemeni coffee is the different blends, like different parts of Yemen. As far as our cafe, the most popular blend I would say is the Mofawar because of the, the darker roast with the cardamom and then the milk. The milk gives the coffee the rich uh, consistency and then the cardamom gives it the aroma and the flavor. All the flavors in the coffee bean. And then on top of that, you just mix it with a little bit of love. I was born here and uh, actually went to Yemen when I was very young. Um, I spent my childhood, my teen years over there, and that's what helped me understand the culture, the traditions, is what helped me uh, get inspired by the Yemeni coffee. For me, in Jav was a bit of a, like an opposite experience. He was born in Yemen and he came to this country when he was very young. My uncle, what he would do, I remember growing up, that they would always bring suitcases. Yeah, just suitcases, what they talk about. Sometimes full of not just the coffee bean, but the coffee husk. We try not to separate from our culture and country and families. We always connect to each other, you know? Friends come from back home, they always travel. So they give us, always calling them, can you please bring me some coffee with you? Like, Five, ten pounds, the other guy like ten pounds, this guy, you know. That's the only way, and this is the best way to get it. Something like that. that's the only way we get it. Otherwise, it's so hard. Right? But before, it's very, like, very easy to get it. You can ship it straight from there. But since this situation back home, the wars and that is very hard. Everybody's afraid. We actually do like little campaigns where we, where we save money ourselves and also from friends and families. And then um, we, we send it over to uh, like um, people that we, uh, that, that we know over there. And um, you know, they give out the money. And shout out some big ups to those people. They, they really help a lot where they are. Uh, they had different locations in different cities and uh, they make bread and then they have the kitchen where they have, uh, where they have and make food and uh, they feed people every day. This is happening in Yemen, but it's from here, like from, from campaigns here. And it started from, from young, young generation uh, of Yemeni people. That's our show this week. Come back next week. And if you like what you see, take a minute and sign up for G-Zero's most excellent morning newsletter. It's called Signal.